Welcome, everybody. And thanks so much for coming today. We have Rosie from Florida and Susan from California. Great to have you. So today we're going to be talking about parenting through opposition. Ooh, Anne from Sweden. Welcome. You, I'm very excited. I don't think we've had someone from Sweden before. Louise from England. Kelly, Tasmania is gorgeous. Keith from Nova Scotia. Welcome. Well, welcome everybody. It's great to have you. And I'd like to start off today's session with a little story. Um, recently, I was in my office with Sal, an eighth grade boy who was complaining about being bored after school to his mom, Darlene, and to me. Oh, there's nothing to do except gaming and you only let me do that for an hour. What else am I supposed to do? His mom gently suggested going back to some activities that had previously interested him car lessons, indoor soccer, swim team, maybe some improvisational theater. No, 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 he said. His mom turned to me and said, do you see what I need to deal with? Um, I used to do this to my mom. It, she called it shoot em up and knock em down. There's never a right answer. I started to wonder, does no mean no, or does no mean forget about it? I'm not sure and I need to think about it. Indoor soccer and theater were hard nose, forget about it. Guitar and swimming were more of an I'll think about it. I asked Sal, why didn't he just say I'll think about it? And he shrugged, I don't know. I just can't think about all that stuff at once. Saying no flat out like that gave him some space to think about something without any pressure. So, what I'd like you to consider today is that with working memory or processing speed challenges, kids with ADHD get quickly overwhelmed emotionally, cognitively, socially. And, um, and the lack of adequate amounts of dopamine or norepinephrine in their brains to help them process or recall information um, efficiently and keep up with all the activity around them um, doesn't occur. They, they just lack that. So, but these are mostly unconscious cognitive processes that kids struggle to articulate. Instead, what most kids tell me is that they simply feel flooded and agitated while they try to muddle through and manage those feelings at school or with friends. At home, they don't feel obligated to hold it all together. As Sal told me, I'm not going to be suspended from my family. So they don't have to hold it together with people who love them and who they love too, despite their actions to the contrary. So I'm curious if you could write in the comment section, what does no mean to your son or daughter? When you think about them saying no, is it a flat out refusal most of the time? Is it, I'm not sure I want to think about it? Is it, I hate you get away from me? What does the no mean? And I'm going to say hello to a couple people, Mary and Michelle, welcome. Um, so what do you think the no means? Because if we think about the iceberg on the, what we see is a big no, what's underneath the water? It's a huge piece of ice, right? We want to know what's in, what, what's contributing to what we see? What's the base of what we see? So I'm curious if you could say in the comment section, what do you, what does what do you think no means to your kids? What do when they say no? What do you think they're trying to communicate? Mary says, "I want to think about it." Anastasia definitely used to gain time. Sometimes flat out refusal. Okay, so we have I want to consider something. I also mm, might want to decide, forget it, or I might want to, um, you know, say no. Al um, Alessandra, for us, it means no, not now. I need space or time to process all that. Supriya says overwhelmed. Carol says it means fear of commitment to, um, to the unknown. Claire, too hard. It's too hard to do. Louise, I've asked my son and he said it means stop, you idiot. Okay, that's clear. Kezia, boundaries. Christine, my son becomes dysregulated and angry. Tanya, refusal, not able to think about it, overwhelmed, can't put needs into words. Anne, I raise them with a no is no, but their dad, no means I'll think about it. Mm, so they're getting kind of different messages from each parent about how you use no. That's interesting. Uh, Laura, never thought about that, but I have no clue. 
Michelle, no means I'm too anxious. Okay. Um, Jessica Gregory, I'm not ready. Uh, means time needed. Mine does it when he's struggling to make a decision. Oh, that's very interesting. My son literally says, I don't want to talk about it. I never thought it was like pressing a pause. It always seemed like avoidance because he doesn't ask to come back to it later. Yeah, sure. Out of sight, out of mind. It means leave me alone. Okay, so what I'm hearing um, is a general consensus that no means I'm not sure and I need to think about it and I'm calling a pause. And for some of you, it's a way to kind of get you out of their face. Uh, I don't want to deal with this now. No comes with screaming and is used for manipulation and get out of some things. Okay. Ronnie, uh, depends on the age. My grandson is seven and gets angry. John, welcome, John. At 40, I still say no is my first response to most things because otherwise it's an anxious yes, and that's much worse. Thank you. I really appreciate that insight. Um, so what I'm going to encourage you to do after this session is to take a, take a minute in a calm moment and talk to your kids, put your curiosity hat on, and ask, what does no mean to them? Now, a lot of you know, understand what no means, um, but I think it's important for us to, in, to remember how to interpret that no. And if we're not sure, to be able to ask a question, is that no, get out of my face? Is that no, I need to think about it? Is that no, I'm overwhelmed? Like we could ask them to choose what that no means for them. Because Perhaps we could brainstorm, brainstorm, excuse me, some alternatives to know that include a few key words or a phrase to use when they need some time to think about something or they're overwhelmed. You know, maybe there could be no overwhelm, or maybe it could be no think, uh, <laughs> time to think, no, um, pause, whatever it is. And for a lot of kids, just being able to say no, to put that gate up, is all they can handle in that moment. So right now, of course, we are still living in a time of so much anxiety. There's a lot of frustration, disappointment, and restriction that children are feeling and living with these days. And it's even harder for so many of them to self-regulate. They may lose their temper more quickly. They may disrespect you verbally and refuse to listen to what you have to say. So I'm curious, when your kids say no to you, what is your initial response? Because your initial response affects how, then affects what they do. So we kind of engage in this, you know, um, domino effect. So when your kids say no to you, how do you respond? And this is, you know, a no shame uh, zone. So put it up there and don't feel bad about it. I will share that when my, when my kids, particularly my daughter, who really was a challenging for me as a teenager, when she would say no, um, sometimes it would be just, no, I don't feel like it. And I would have to go like into another room to calm down. But sometimes her no wouldn't be a no. It would be leave me alone. Uh, I don't want to talk to you. And then I still wouldn't have an answer to my question. Those times were much harder for me because we got into this pursue withdrawal cycle and I would continue to pursue. Um, Tina says, you don't say no. Okay, so you say you don't say no. Laura, why? What do you need? Okay, um, Mary, my eight-year-old daughter says in a minute instead of no, but really gets around to doing that thing I asked of her. Interesting. Jessica, sometimes I get triggered, but learning to self-regulate myself when this happens. Right. So that's always a challenge for us as parents. How are we going to regulate ourselves in the face of, you know, inappropriate or frustrating behavior? Louise says, I leave my son alone if I can, unless he's at risk. Okay. So sometimes what you do when your kids say no, or they're dysregulated is you understand, I'm going to step back so that they can have some space to cool down. And then we might be able to address an issue in a different way with a different tone of voice. So one of the things that happens is that how is that the choices that we make are choices that affect the stability and the sort of environment in our homes and the connections that we're trying to keep intact in the parent-child relationship. Jessica says, for my hubby, he feels it's disrespectful and he threatens or takes things away, which then triggers my kids to explode. 
Lissa says, I usually have a list of things that need to be done. And when no one comes, I say you can pick one of these things to do first. Wonderful. So one of the things that um, I've noticed is that since nobody really likes the meltdowns and nobody likes the explosions or the arguments, um, what happens is that w when, when we're triggered as adults, that we have a harder time um, because we want to, what we're, we are trying in our adult way to get stuff done. That seems to be like the MO for adults. It's just like, I got to get stuff done. And when your kids say no, it slows the process down, which can be very frustrating. Christine says, I try to avoid that no by getting buy-in ahead of time. Ter terrific. So um, kids with ADHD have told me repeatedly that they feel bad about themselves after these outbursts and that many parents also have told me that they regret what they've said or done. But in moments of high emotion, people naturally stop listening and quickly move into fight, flight, or, or fight or flight mode. I don't see so much freeze mode in these situations. So whether or not you have ADHD, you're not listening, you're reacting because rationality has flown out the window. So what I'd like to try to help you is instead of being surprised every time there's some defiance or opposition, explosive anger or disrespect, it's more useful to expect that these will occur and to rely on a strategy for when they do. It's the resistance um, that actually wears families down and the combativeness, right? You get tired of doing that. So I'd love to hear from you a little bit about the things, uh, the kinds of reactions you're seeing in your family with your kids and what you're doing in response. What are some typical no's for your kids and how do you deal with that? Um, let's see. Uh, and also, you know, when there are these moments where your kids are saying no and you're triggered, you know, we have to try to, in the moment, sort of understand what's going on for us as well as to speculate what's going on for him. And a lot of times there's things are happening so, so quickly that there's just this chaos. And you can't figure out what to do. So what I would like to do today is if you could put in the um, chat what are the kinds of things your kids say no to? And where do you get triggered? Laura says, OMG, you nailed it. I'm exhausted. I understand. Harlan, I try to avoid the shoulds of a relationship, like disrespect or role reversal. I like that. I try to see it as a condition of the situation, not a personal affront. Right, because it's usually not a personal affront. Um, Rita, you see this in not wanting to get off electronics. Megan, asking for her to do her schoolwork, take a shower or eat. Okay, so there's a lot of demand avoidance. Tina, when my daughter needs to calm down, I tell her that she will, I tell her that she will say no to breathing or going to a time in area. Mm -hmm. Doing homework. Megan, I'm so tired of arguing. Sarah, the biggest opposition comes from transition from something he's enjoying to something he has to do. It seems like I'm always trying to get him to do things. Tanya, bedtime, remind them that sleep is important for health, rest, and for the body to grow. Pfft, they probably don't even care that much. Um, Andrea, transitioning from one activity to another. Louise, my son's ADHD and ASD and PDA, so I get constant refusal, so I use indirect demands. That's fantastic. Um, so we, instead of saying, I want you to, we ask, would you be willing to, or what would it be like, or how can we? Mm -hmm. I think that's great. Um, Greg, Jessica says, oh no, wait, uh, let's see. Um, Laura, my, our biggest issue is getting ready in the morning. There are many stall tactics to avoid getting ready. I'm late every single day. Help. Okay, Laura, let's address that for a minute. So I'm curious in the morning, <clears throat> if you have the things that need to be done on a list that's posted somewhere on your refrigerator, is there an incentive to getting those things done that you're that is attached to something your child can earn after school like perhaps some screen time or do, can they get in the car can they choose the music that you listen to what are some of the things that that would be a benefit to continue to sort of stay on task 
um, sometimes kids do well with like the watch mind or or some or their phone with alerts to, to, to keep to keep them you know going along what has to get done um, plus you know it might be that you need to actually change the time that you say you're going to leave the house to something earlier so that um, you have built in um, non-compliance time uh, to when um, for the morning um, I do think that it does help if you can sort of incentivize you know when you do these things you'll earn this and whether it's right away or at the end of the day Jessica cleaning up toys is usually a no or an in in, the, in a minute so I try to make it a game with a music or a timer it usually works then I let them know I'm here to help them wonderful that's a great suggestion Megan amen Karen anytime there is a demand put on okay so you're getting kids who are really demand avoidant and who are saying no absolutely all the time no matter what and um, they say no one asked to help from uh, to ask from help from household chores excuse me I see so um, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting question because you know if you live in a house everybody has to do chores everyone has to chip in and I think that it is important to link the chores to something again that they want you do the have to and then the want to so if they're not willing to do chores have you thought about family chore time where everyone chips in and then there's something that's fun on the other side of that um, or you do your chores before you get to play your game um, or you know get together with friends Sarah it's almost like he doesn't do what needs to be done unless I get angry oh that's so interesting so part of what I am hearing from you Sarah is that he doesn't know you mean business until you're just over the top and that's actually really un unpleasant for you and unfortunate for him so I am wondering how you can create a system where you're warning him that you're getting close to that you know maybe it's one it's counting one two and three um, so that he knows that when you get to three and you let him know when you get to three you're not going to earn your extra computer time today so you're at two so I'm just going to start counting and if I get to three you're not going to earn that computer time and if he says fine I don't care then you let that go until he wants the computer time and then you can remind him that tomorrow if he wants to earn his computer time he'll have to do the chore and then he can get it you know sometimes it take it takes more than sometimes most of the time it takes a lot of practice and repeating 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 um, Laura all he has to do is get dressed and that's it um, okay Laura does he get dressed in your room with you can you make getting dressed a game um, I, I would assume that he would I would assume that getting dressed is something he might need to do before breakfast I had a kid that had a really hard time getting dressed in the morning and in that family what the mother did was the mother let him watch 15 minutes of television while he got dressed and he was able to do that better that you know may not be your solution and there are a lot of pros and cons to that solution she also let him brush his teeth in front of the television with a cup and a bowl to spit in so that's an extreme kind of intervention um, I, I don't feel like accommodating in that way is always is often very helpful to kids so I would encourage you to do something different like we're gonna get dressed together so bring your clothes in here let's do underwear let's do socks let's do pants that kind of thing Jessica I'm learning that my kids need some direction and guidance rather than to be told threats or contention I totally agree so when I let them know I'm here to help you clean up or get dressed it relieves their anxiety or their behavior right because they're not sure what to do or they're worried that they're not gonna you know do it right or um, they may not remember what the steps are they may get distracted you know they pick up their pants and they look see on the floor that it's their favorite Lego they want to go get their Lego so I think it's important that if you can you know do things together um, then they won't feel so anxious and they'll also watch you move through the steps so they can do the same Megan yes this okay I'm not sure what that is Amanda it's important how you ask can you are you able to would you like to low arousal helps absolutely because if you as soon as you get into you need to and you have to and you must it becomes an authority author, an issue of authority 
and um, asking asking in that way is a much more in, inviting and collaborative approach. Louise, now next and later sequence cards helps. That's a great idea. We're currently trying best the timer. Okay, great. Uh, Louise, timers help too and counting games. Yes. You know, you can also do games like fastest, first, um, particularly for elementary school age kids, you know, who can get dressed fastest? I've got my timer on. Let's see. Is it you or me? Um, Michelle, um, for us it helped when we did the same thing in the same order every day. My son now sets his own Alexa to help with his timings. Fabulous. What I like about what you're talking about, Michelle, is routines. Routines are so stabilizing and organizing and grounding for these kids. Um, it, it helps with that predictability. And because a lot of kids feel like things are so unpredictable, either now because of what's happening in the world with COVID or within themselves, I don't know when I'm going to feel this or I'm going to act this way or I'm going to say the wrong thing or someone's going to be mad at me. A routine for, for, for sort of con for concrete tasks can be very helpful and productive. Thank you, Sarah Ellen, exactly. Sarah Ellen, I can relate. It's like my kids need the adrenaline rush to do the thing. What gets their adrenaline going is yelling, but I'm learning that I can increase their adrenaline by making things exciting rather than a drag or a yell. Wonderful. I think that's a great idea, Jessica. Phyllis, my 15-year-old son doesn't say no. He just doesn't get up and do what he needs to do. So now we're getting into the adolescent part of this struggle. He's usually on the Xbox. It's anything brush your teeth. Um, it, sorry, excuse me. It's anything. Brush your teeth, take a shower, go to bed, wake up, get ready for school. He hates school. I've set timers, made all kinds of deals with him. So one of the things, and, and this is something that I, you know, I'm sure you're not alone, Phyllis, is that, um, you know, Xbox is a privilege. And the, some of these other things you're talking about, like self-care, brushing your teeth, taking a shower, going to bed at a reasonable time, waking up and going to school, these are all things that have to be done in order to earn that privilege. And right now, I think one of the things that happens in a lot of families, and this is absolutely normal, it happened during COVID, is that kids... Um, and that parents gave their kids a lot of leeway with technology and gaming, and now trying to sort of, you know, take it back, and it's a lot harder. So uh, I don't think timers work necessarily. It sounds like, and deals aren't going to work. So what you what it, you have to do is go back to the basics. You can have this amount of time, 30 minutes every day. You get that automatically. How you get off that 30 minutes determines if you get the other. You know, how you get off that 30 minutes will determine if you get another 30 minutes. Uh, if you've gone to bed at, at the hour we agree on, that's another 30 minutes. If you showered and brushed your teeth, that's another 30 minutes. There's your two hours that you want to have. Lots of comments. I'm so glad I found out about this live. I feel much better knowing I can help my child even more. Wonderful, Eva. Welcome. You're welcome, Sarah Allen. Judy, you may do that thing when the job is done. Positive first helps. I agree. Um, Keezy, a checklist for our AM afternoon and evening routine. That really also is so important, Kezia, because, and I don't know if I'm saying your name right, so I apologize, it might be Kezia. So, um, but that checklist is very, it's helpful for kids for a number of reasons. One, it helps them with working memory lapses. Um, they can see what they need to do. It helps them with organization. It's up there. It helps them with sequencing. It's right there. Um, they can plan, you know, oh, this, I got, you know, what am I, you know, what, how much time might this take or what do I need for this task? So having a list is very helpful. Jessica, I love that strategy. Or you can do 15 minute intervals to earn time. Great. Wonderful. Um, let's see. Harlan says, for me, I learned to be more self maintaining when I understood the natural penalty of not doing. The words need, should, must, everyone must makes my nerves vibrate even during this live. <laughs> Thanks, Harlan. So um, I was playing around a little bit and I was thinking that um, what could we, what kind of program could I create that would help when kids say no? So I, you know, did a little, did a little thinking and I came up with 
pause, a pause program. Plan to accept, understand, set limits, and encourage. So this will lay the foundation for making different choices and fostering stability in your home. So plan, you, you know, really, it's really important to make a plan to cope with the pattern of anger, negativity, no oppositionality that is happening. Otherwise you'll be playing whack-a-mole. I'll get to, I'll deal with this problem and then the next one will pop up. So in a quiet moment, make a list of what you can do for yourself to stay grounded. Because if you're dysregulated, you won't be able to respond effectively and you won't be able to help your youngster calm down. So whether it's going to the bathroom to collect yourself for a few minutes, getting a glass of water, or opening a window, break up the action in a non-threatening way. This recentering needs to be your first reflexive step. Sorry, Harlan, I said needs to slow down the fast paced action that's building in front of you. Once you've clarified this for yourself, then you can sit down with your child and ask them what's, what helps them regroup and how much time do they need for it? What do you see? What do they see? Phyllis, I see that you're having some connection issues. I'm very sorry. There's a lot of weather that's going on around here and it's coming in. So that may be affecting what's happening. Um, let me see if I can do something. If I turn the Wi-Fi off, let me see. Is that better for people? Let me know if that's better. Okay. So uh, what is the pause plan? So that was the P for pause. So then write down your options, write down some of these ways to gather yourself together and post the list in, your, in, in their room or in the kitchen. Okay, now accept, stop trying to convince your child or teen of, of anything. Rather accept where you both are in a given moment. Remember their listening stopped when they became activated and they want to be seen and heard by you. Your listening may have stopped also when you became activated. So acknowledge what they're saying with reflective listening. I heard you say this, did I get that right? When they, feel, when they, when they see and sense that you are paying attention instead of correcting them or waiting for them to stop talking uh, or justifying, um, you know, whatever it is, they will start to settle. It might be tense and uncomfortable, but you, but both of you can do this because um, it particularly, particularly you. But we as parents want things to be better for our kids and we, we try to fix it or we try to get to the, the bottom of the problem so we can solve it. And that doesn't always work. So we want to kind of accept where we are. It's that radical acceptance. This is where we are now let's deal with this. Let's not project into the future. Let's not um, pull up incidents from the past. Let's deal with the no right now. The U is for understand. So as tough as it can be, empathy is what's called for when kids, especially those with ADHD, are distressed. Their feelings have overwhelmed their thinking brains and their weaker executive functioning skills simply can't manage their heightened emotions. They're acting out because they lack the resources to do anything different in those moments. Um, so um, um, they really want need, they, they really benefit from caring adults to dig in and dig deep um, and, um, and find some compassion rather than exploding about how they should get their act together. Okay, I think someone put something in about plan, but it disappeared. So if you would put that up again, because I'm not seeing comments. Um, so if someone could just write a hello, let me make sure that our, our, our live video is still working. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Chris, I appreciate that. Reflective listening comes across as patronizing. I'm not sure it does, because you can couch it in something differently. Say, okay, so you're, you're upset about blah, blah, blah. Um, you're angry um, that this, you know, we don't have to say what I heard you say is, I mean, I, I know that's what I said, but you, you know, that can be, that can be useful, but you can also just take what they said and repeat it back to them. Is that right? Um, 
So we, we don't want to come across as patronizing. And, and I know that some kids, um, uh, kids feel that way. Um, when kids are resistant or oppositional or intransigent, many parents feel a desperate need to regain authority and establish stability by taking things away from their kids. While punishments may offer short-term relief, they don't actually bring long-term success. Why? Because we're not teaching skills and we're not using incentives. So we want to really shift from saying things like, I'm taking your phone away for three days, you can't talk to me that way, to turning it around and saying, you've not earned the privilege of using your phone with that language. When you can go for three days without cursing at me, you can have it back. That's the agreement that we have in our family. So we want to rely on, on, on flipping things instead of, here's what's wrong with you, I'm gonna take this away, which is often what happens in moments of stress, and I've done that too, to um, this, this privilege isn't earned yet, um, you can earn it by doing blah, blah, blah. So uh, then what is the S? Um, um, S is our goal is teaching kids with ADHD the executive functioning skills they need, right? For self-regulation, school behavior, and productivity. It's a natural part of living to become angry, to want to get your own way, and to avoid disappointment. But it's not okay to be aggressive about these, and that's what we need to teach our kids over and over again. So because the reason punishment doesn't teach any skills is because it just rules by fear. Um, we want kids to be motivated to make other choices. Logical consequences, on the other hand, can allow you to set limits and use meaningful incentives as motivators. The trick is to stay steady in the face of your child or teen's displeasure in a really very frustrating behavior and sometimes horrible language and to follow through. So that's why we wanna go back to those family meetings where we make a collaborative agreement about actions and words and ask kids, what do you think the logical consequence should be for something like this? They often come up with their own ideas. Um, and finally, the E in pause is encourage. Once the storm has passed, we want to focus on the present moment. What needs to happen now? That's the question, to move beyond the wreckage. This is not the time right after the storm to teach a lesson. What we want to do, uh, because what we want to do is, is just move to the next right thing. The situation is still too raw for your child or teen to start a conversation about what they could have done differently. Um, instead, what's the next right thing? How are we gonna move forward? You may wanna talk about your upset and why you think they should do it differently and how, but they're not there. So we wanna put press pause, ha ha ha, and come back to that later in the day or at a quiet time, maybe the next day, okay? Um, they need encouragement, not blame in these moments. So we wanna encourage them for how we're gonna move forward, okay? Later, you know, you can casually wonder, hmm, you know, what are some of the takeaways from that incident? Was there anything you yourself regretted as the adult? Was there anything they regretted? And how do you think you two of you could deal with this kind of behavior in the future? This opens the conversation and explores options and fosters collaborative engagement. So let me see what's in the chat. Um, I did see that someone wrote something about plan, P-L, uh, let's see. Um, okay, here I am. All right, um, uh, Amanda. I think it depends on your, their neurotype. ADHD can be combined with PDA autism. Absolutely. The issue, I think, parents have belief systems from what they know, from how they were parented, or we can continue a pattern or learn it a different way. Yes. And in times of stress, what's going to happen is you're going to revert to how you were raised, you know, even despite your best intentions. And, and I have to say, I've done that. 
particularly with my daughter, and I super regret it. Eva says, my six-year-old says, I cannot control my body. <laughs> Every time he gets called out for not being nice or gentle to his toddler brother, what do you recommend to do? Um, I think that in those moments, you could say, um, learning to control your, bar your body is part of being six. So when you feel like you cannot control your body, you need to call me. Or um, yet maybe you couldn't control your body. How should we make? How should we have you make amends or make this up to your brother? Um, and what would it? You know, and for you to continually say hand, you know, hand, body parts to yourself, use your words instead of using your body. Phyllis, I've told him it's a privilege that's to be earned. I've taken it away until he does X amount of stuff, but then he refuses to do anything and is threatened to damage my iPod. Okay, so then actually that means you're getting somewhere, Phyllis, because if he's threatening to damage your iPod, he's showing you that he's pretty desperate. So you want to lock that stuff up and um, he's, and then present him with choices. You have this choice and, or you have this choice. Um, having you know what I call directed free choice, which my friend created, uh, Susan Herman, um, where may you rest in peace. Um, this directed free choice is very helpful for kids who are um, who ha are on the PDA autism spectrum or are you know really digging in and refusing to do something. Well, you can do this and earn that, or you can do this and not earn that, or you can you know in order to earn this thing, you can choose this or choose that. Amanda, absolutely. Uh, Phyllis, okay, these are the, all the connection issues. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, you're doing better now. I don't know if I got spoons. Um, I hope at some point I can put these ideas into practice instead of just staying in my negative normal patterns. Oh, Stacy, hmm. I'm so tired about fighting about family chores and devices. Have you ever thought about putting out a list of scripting for common issues like these? Maybe if I can get a script together, I can stop saying or doing the wrong thing. You know what, Stacy? I am so grateful for this idea, and I will write a blog. I will make a note, or maybe, Annie, we could do a Facebook Live on scripting, common issues like this. In the meantime, what I'm going to say to you is hang in there, okay? If you want to stop fighting about family chores and devices, sit down with the family. Ask them, because they don't want to fight about these things either. So pick one issue that you all agree on is the number one thing to work on and just focus on that and give a little more slack to some of the other things and stick with that and stick with it. And when things start to shift in that area, keep going. Then you might be able to add something else in. So, you know, in a calm moment or here in these Facebook lives, take some notes or you know, come back to them because they're recorded on YouTube. They're on YouTube uh, for Attitude and Mind, YouTube as well. And you can go back and say, what was that thing that she said again or this person suggested? That will help you come up with a list of things to do. But that's a great idea, scripts where you can say, that you can say or do to help your kids. I really appreciate that. Tanya, but we also need to let kids know it's okay to feel emotions, but in a safe manner. Absolutely. They can have their feelings, but what they can't do is hurt others because they're having their feelings, right? You can't kick the wall because you're angry. You can say, I'm angry. You might want to cry that you're angry. You may want to punch your bed because you're angry, but you can't punch your brother. Let's see. And my, me and my husband have been working uh, hard to educate ourselves about ADHD, to have a better understanding with our son who is 11 years old now. He is more calmer and has matured a little. Showing him that he has our support makes him feel more, makes him more secured about things going on that is uncontrolled by him. That's right. That's really beautifully said, Anne, because when kids feel uh, that they are in this family crucible of love and support, they feel more stability in that area so that they can carry some of that into other areas where they don't feel that at all. Jessica, pause, plan ahead and options, accept, nurture and acknowledge, understand, compassion, self-regulate, encouragement. Beautiful. Um, 
that is kind of what I was saying. So thank you so much for being so articulate at putting it together. I love that. Um, well, it's a little bit different. Yes, it is. Okay, it's a reframe. Thank you. Harlan, every parent should be hearing this. I feel like this is a warm hug of understanding. Thank you so much from me, both as a coach for others and an active participant in this. Oh, Harlan, hug right back at you. Hug to you, all of you. Um, Jessica, I hope I took the notes correctly on pause. That was beautiful, Jessica. Thank you. Um, Sarah, what do you do when you when your child doesn't want to earn the rewards? Minus says, I don't want to earn points today and similar things. That's okay. So you may not want to earn points today. Great. Then you're not going to do the privileges. You know, you can, we can do something else, you know, that's up to you, but you don't want to do the things and you're not going to earn that privilege. And I think in, in a way, you know, being able to say, I don't feel like it is, an, is, an, is sort of a demonstration of autonomy. I want to show you that I can say yes, or I can say no. Okay, great. You show me. You're going to live with the consequence because I'm going to continue to go about my day. You may live with the consequence also, because perhaps by saying no, your child doesn't earn any TV time. And that means you can't watch, have, have that half hour of family TV time. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm so embarrassed. Uh, um, a little health issue in my family, so I apologize. Uh, I revert to how I was reprimanded in my own childhood as well, almost every time, and it's embarrassing. And I'm always apologizing to my son afterwards. I feel I'm giving off mixed. I'm giving off two mixed messages, and I am. So here's the thing, Alessandra. You're doing the best you can with the tools that you have and the tools that you learned. And you know what, there were there have been moments in my parenting, particularly when my kids were younger, where things would come out of my mouth and I'd be like, oh my God, I am my father, who would lose his temper and it was very frightening. Um, it felt horrible. And in fact, recently, my daughter said to me, when you, when you got mad at me like that, I felt that you didn't see me and my and you didn't meet my needs or couldn't meet my needs at all and that felt bad. Okay, let's stab me in the heart right here, right? Stab me in the heart. That felt awful. I had a good cry about that. But you know what? I'm so glad that they told me. I'm so glad that they told me because you know what? They're right. When I was dysregulated, I didn't see them. And that was wounding. And all I can do is try to do a better job now. So you're gonna stumble. It's, you know, and you're gonna have moments where you are soaring like an eagle. You're doing, you're in the flow of parenting. You got it. That's, it's both, uh, it's a both and. Be kind to yourself. Hi, Donnie Feed. Timing and accusatory attack mode for communication never works when it's a heated meltdown or a moment meltdown of a moment I need to filter. That is so true. <laughs> Alessandra, I'm doing inner child healing to overcome this and heal generational trauma. I want to break the cycles I learned in childhood and it's possible to heal ourselves. That's so true, Jessica. You know, I think about, you know, how we come from lines, right? I myself come from lines of, of women you know, a Jewish women, I'm a Jewish woman, and, you know, who m moved here from Russia <laughs> and Romania. And, um, and so, you know, I bring that history consciously and unconsciously, I bring those patterns. And all we can do in this life is to is to enhance our awareness and make uh, make different choices, attempt to change habits and accept that we're going to stumble. Sarah, you love the idea of scripting. Okay, scripts for common flashpoints is a great idea. Annie, we're on it. Um, okay, Laura, I would love script ways to respond versus react. Um, that is fabulous. I think we're going to do that. So, it, you know, stay tuned. That'll be coming your way sometime this spring. Anastasia, I'm struggling with my three-year-old with not wanting to do things, but he is not at quite at a stage of communication for our family meetings and coming up with reasonable consequences. That's also part of being three. You know, I feel like there are certain theme songs for different ages. Two is Hello, Goodbye by the Beatles. You say yes, I say no. 
three is I did it my way. Think about Frank Sinatra and four is, you know, I am Superman. Um, so it's, it's actually a completely developmentally appropriate for a three-year-old to say no um, and to do things their own way. Um, will this be live? Yes. Uh, to watch. Yes. I need scripts. Okay. We got the message scripts. Um, Alessandra, I would love for you to DM me specific links to where I can start. I appreciate the guidance. The best thing for you to do, Alessandra, is to email me personally via my website, info at drsharonceline.com. Charlotte, what if things have gone too far and you sell, I have seldom used consequences? My boy is 10 now and has started being DA at school, was only usually at home. How to gently put things in place to reduce potential for massive meltdowns, how to start at 10. Well, good news is he's 10. He's not 15, 20, 25. And, you know, it gets harder as kids get older, of course, but it's never impossible to change. Think about yourself. Um, so um, you wanna put things in place to potentially reduce uh, massive meltdowns. And if you could post some links through Attitude, whether it's about my five C's or how to help kids manage themselves when they're upset, that would be really useful. Um, let's see. Uh, in fact, I will put up a downloadable for everybody right now on managing anger, um, which I think could probably be really helpful. So hold on one second. I'm going to check that out for you before we stop. Um, let's see. I'm just looking here. Um, uh, this is a, uh, what's up with, this is a, um, a five C's of ADHD parenting bonus handout. So this will have some tips and tools for dealing with anger and intense emotions. So here you go. Check that out. Um, Alessandra, don't be embarrassed. It happens to the best of us. Thank you. Uh, Mary, my daughter has intense uh, rejection sensitivity with her ADHD and stops or quits any task or assignment she thinks will fail. She'll fail or come up with a wrong answer. I find myself running out of patience when she cries all day during distance learning because things are hard taking away privileges. No, you don't want to take away privileges for that. Um, she's really struggling. She's hurting. And she doesn't feel a sense of competence in able to do things. She And she's also kind of struggling with perfectionism. So I think taking things away um, is really, uh, will, will make that worse. And distance learning for kids is just horrible. Let's just be real. It's so difficult for so many kids. Some kids love it and some kids don't. So um, uh, I wouldn't, I, you know, if she's, what we have to motivate her is to, is that they're, you know, to work in smaller blocks of time and just getting through school, um, even if she doesn't do the work, may be enough. And I would encourage you to make sure that she has accommodations, you know, a 504 IEP accommodations if you live in the United States. Thank you, Alessandra. Oh, thank you, Charlotte. Um, thank you, Attitude. Um, yes, Karen. Amanda, hey, we are all human, trying to do the best is that what matters, a amen. Um, Militia, Militia, me too, I'm in the same boat with my husband. Um, uh, Donnie Feed, parenting is such a labor of love, but love it, and I have to be intentional with loving it, but still being firm with expectation for my <laughs> 13, stubborn 13 year old version of me. Mm. Um, okay, so we are, oh, we are out over time. Um, uh, my teacher thinks, my, uh, my, I, my the teacher thinks my son needs one for his behavior at school, but his behavior is only when kids bother him. Will this help even when he's not taking medication? Is it better to homeschool him? I think it's important um, in not necessarily to take to homeschool him in this situation because you're taking away the situation that he actually needs to learn the skills for. So I would actually work on some accommodation, uh, maybe a friend, if there's a friendship group at school or a little bit of counseling to help him learn how to manage in those situations. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so good, you guys. Thank you. Um, good. I'm glad she has an EIP. I would definitely make sure that her, that her plan 
is for getting through school, not necessarily doing any homework. And if she does have to do homework, what are they going to do to supply someone to help? Eva, teaching my kids growth mindset has helped them deal with feelings of incompetence. Eh, that is so true. You're welcome, Stacy. Hmm. You're welcome, Jessica. Thank you all so much for coming today. This is very beautiful and meaningful, and we will uh, work on uh, talking points. Um, and Annie, can you put up how we can get the replay uh, for Laura? That would be great. Um, I wish all of you a wonderful weekend. And for those of you who live on the East Coast of the United States, <laughs> where we may be getting this amazing, amazing, amazing and like enormous, incredible storm, stay safe, stay, um, stay warm. And I look forward to seeing you next Friday. Take care. Blessings. Bye-bye.